So good morning. Um, welcome to the IoT Summer School or Internet of Things Summer School. Um, my name is Alex, and I'm going to teach you the first part of the course, which is um, an introduction to the Internet of Things, a little bit about electronics, a little bit about sensors and other stuff, and uh, a little bit about programming. Okay, so today we're going to talk a little bit about the Internet of Things, and we'll have a um, little introduction into the field. So first of all, we will talk uh, why there is a need and why people like the Internet of Things. Then uh, we're going to talk about what the Internet of Things represents. Um, we're going to see a little bit of the history of Internet of Things. Also, we're going to talk about the hardware and the software, which is used to implement the Internet of Things. And afterwards, if you have any questions, you can ask. Also, please stop me if you don't understand something or you have a question, just raise your hand. So first of all, why? So what is the Internet of Things and why we use it? And I think uh, the best um, reason is that we're lazy. And we want to automate everything. We need to control everything. And we want to see, want to see data in real time. So this is mainly why we use the Internet of Things. So we can't park anymore if we don't have a parking sensor. We um, can't buy uh, tickets online if we don't have a phone and we want to buy tickets on the phone. We can't go outside if we don't see the weather on the phone, so on and so forth. So basically, um, this is why we want to uh, use the Internet of Things. So what is the Internet of Things? This is the schematics of what the Internet of Things represent. So first of all, we have the sensors. And these are the little pieces that we put outside or we put on our bike on the, or we put it on our car. Um, these are the things that collect data and send it back to some processing device. The next level in Internet of Things is local processing. So we have a device that can process some data from the sensors and take some decisions. Then we have the local storage, so um, some of the data, because the data collected from the sensors is huge, um, is going to be stored locally, and we need a way to do this. Then we have the network, because it's Internet of Things, and we need to interconnect the things. And then we have the Internet to send the data over to a cloud processing, which has much more power than the local processing. And then we have the cloud storage, where we want to store the data. So this would be an ideal schematics. Do you know what's happening today out of this? So basically today we have the sensors, which we usually connect to the network, push all data to the cloud, and use the cloud for heavy lifting. And basically what is happening at the moment is that we collect a huge amount of sensor data, the cloud need to, needs to process it, and most of the data isn't relevant for the cloud. So I will give you an example of why this is bad. For instance, let's say we have a motion sensor that um, supervises this room. It's going to collect data and send the data to the cloud. If it's a motion sensor, probably it collects data, let's say, every second, in the best case. So it has 3,600 points per hour multiplied by 24, multiplied by 7, you can see how many points we have in a week. So this is a lot. And basically, the motion sensor is more or less useless. So the data from the motion sensor is useless, because mostly there's motion every day during the day, and there's no motion during the night. So the cloud is collecting a huge amount of data, which is not really relevant. The ideal idea of Internet of Things would be that the motion sensor collects the data, sends it to some local processing, and if there is something that which is not normal, so there's a burglar in the room, then send the data back to the cloud and alert the police. Um, I don't know if this example is very clear. So, so this, this is uh, the problem today. So um, easily, easily, we are moving towards the idea of processing data locally, but for the moment, the paradigm is collect data, push it to the cloud, and wait something from the cloud. So, okay, these are the fields. So Internet of Things can be applied in any field. 
from agriculture to transportation to um, health sciences, so on and so forth. And this is a very good picture in what this supplies. Uh, have you used the Internet of Things? Can you give me some examples where you use the Internet of Things? So one would be a smart TV, but m mostly, okay, it connects to the internet, but it's like a gateway to the internet. The TV is like a computer. So basically it presents data, but doesn't take any decisions, and it, it still ne the TV needs you to uh, handle the internet part. Smart watches. Smart watches, okay, so smart watches are a good example. Activity trackers. Something else? Okay, th that's a good example. So Google Nest. So smartwatches and activity trackers uh, can also work on their own. Mostly they will be connected to the internet, but just to push some data and for you to brag that you actually w walked more. Uh, Google Nest is a better example indeed. So do you know Google Nest? What is Google Nest? It's a thermostat, yes? Um, why is it important for Google? That's one, but why did they actually buy Nest? Because they collect data. So the Nest is working autonomously. You can set up your temperature from your phone and it will keep your house warm. But in the same time, it sends data to back to Google, which Google can uh, analyze. And basically, somehow they can know if you're home and, or you're not home. Because when you're home, the temperature goes up. When you're not home, it goes down and they need to uh, vary this. So yes, Nest is a good example, but um, these were, li so we saw examples in health, we saw examples in lifestyle, other examples. So, excuse me? Google Wallet, um, no, it's still a tool. So it connects to the internet, but it's like a tool. Let's see, Did, do you know Internet of Things in transportation? If you go to Paris, uh, you will see automatic uh, subways. So there's a, a subway line where you don't have a driver. So the subway comes to the station, the door opens, people get in, it detects when people finished to get in, it closes the doors and goes to the next station. This is Internet of Things again. It, the train is full of sensors, it knows when people go in, people go out, if somebody has an accident at the door, so on and so forth. So that's another example of Internet of Things. Um, do we have other examples? Smart exactly. So in agriculture, we have um, smart devices that measure the humidity, the the quality of the soil, and can make several predictions. Okay, you need to sow today, or it's not a good day for agriculture, or so on and so forth. Also, in agric agriculture, it can be used to predict um, the moment of failure of machines. So we put sensors into tractors, for instance, and it's very bad if you have a tractor and uh, during the middle of the campaign when you need to get the grains, it fails. So with several sensors and connection to um, some machine learning cloud, it could actually predict that the tractor is going to fail in a few days, so then you're prepared for this and you can replace the parts one day before. Okay, so this is the big picture of Internet of Things. Let's get each, each part and analyze it. So basically sensors. Sensors are small devices which measure some kind of data, some kind of value. Usually they have an analog input, meaning they measure temperature, wind speeds, or something from nature and convert it into digital data, into electronic data. Sensors usually do no processing, or very little processing. Um, they do only the processing necessary to convert the data from something in the environment in, ele in something electronic. Um, they usually consume low power because they need to work um, a lot of time. So basically, um, you will see a lot of Bluetooth sensors, Bluetooth 4, which can work two years with the same battery. So that is very important. So small pieces that collect data, less processing, these are at the bottom of the food chain of Internet of Things. 
The second step, or second component, or layer in the Internet of Things should be some local processing and local storage. Um, as I said, this idea is still not used. Most of the sensors simply shout out the data and the device that should do some processing is simply uploading the data to the cloud. In an ideal way, and this is the um, paradigm proposed by Intel and Cisco. Intel calls it, calls it edge computing, Cisco calls it fog computing. Um, fog, because it's at the edge of the cloud, so it's fog before you enter the cloud, and edge, again, edge of the cloud. Um, you sh ideally, you should have some device that connects data from the sensors, a computer, basically. The computer should have the power necessary to process some data, make some decisions locally, store some data in case of um, debugging or fail safe or logs, and also be able to upload some of the data to the cloud, data that is relevant. As I said, the motion sensor in a room, if nothing happens, the motion sensor will simply send zeros, a stream of zeros to the cloud, which is useless. In this case, it sends a stream of zeros to a local storage. That local storage processes the data. When it senses some motion, it can detect if there's really a burglar in the room or it, there's only the wind. And if, there is, if it is the case, it can report to the cloud, okay, we have a problem in the room. So this would be the local processing and local storage. Um, and uh, further on, we're going to see how we can implement this. Networking and Internet. So the networking and Internet uh, provide the connectivity for the Internet of Things. So until now, we had only the things, and now we go to the Internet part. Usually, um, you will have some Internet gateway. Um, several providers already built ha are building hardware for this. Um, it connects to the local processing device pulls out the data from relevant data from the local processing device and sends it to the cloud. Um, it can be compared to your local access point at home or to your local gateway, or it actually can be that gateway. Um, for the Internet of Things, we have a series of protocols which are used. Um, the first two, CoAP and MQTT, are especially designed for um, Internet of Things or machine-to-machine communication. Uh, the other two, HTTP and XMPP, I think are better known. Do you know? Uh, HTTP, you know. It's the web protocol. XMPP? It's the, the chat. It's video and chat. It used to be uh, useful for Google. Um, the first two are good for machine-to-machine -machine communication, but less secure. These ones, HTTP and XMPP, are very secure, but add some overhead. So one, one of the last components of um, IoT is cloud processing and storing. Today, it's not used properly. Basically, people today send all the data from the sensors to the cloud, expect the cloud to process that, and give them some answer back. This is not the way it should be used in IoT. Um, sensor, sh sensor information should be collected by IoT gateways, um, fog computing devices, basically. And the data that is already processed by these devices should be sent to the cloud. The cloud's job should be to aggregate this data, uh, compute results, but compute results based on data that it collected from many, many sensors and offer some uh, predictions. And we'll see some software that already can do this and does it really, really well. But you, it's important to understand that the cloud needs to aggregate data, make inferences, and store the data on long term. I will give you an example um, for Facebook. If you, you know tagging on Facebook? OK, even if you don't enable tagging, Facebook has so much information that basically it can say when you make a picture, when you take a picture and upload it to Facebook, it can recognize people in, the, in that picture. Even if it does not display it to you, they still know who, who is in that picture. And this is what you need to do for IoT. So collect a huge amount of sensor data and then give some results. So we need to see how did it start. And this sign is really, really important. Mm, have you seen it before? Open hardware, do you know open source? It's the same thing for hardware. 
So something that is very, very important in open source is that you can take somebody's code, look at it, change it, and make it do something on your own. Um, Ten years ago, hardware was pretty closed. So you had big companies, or maybe smaller companies, that would produce hardware. But it would have been very hard for a user to take the hardware, modify it, and make his own product out of it. And when I was little, I used to dismantle all my toys. Usually never been able to put them back. <laughs> but we all did this, exactly. Um, it would be hard for somebody to change it. And this changed with open hardware. So like open source, some hardware producers, which adopt the, um, the trend, design hardware, but publish the schematics. So you can take the hardware, see that, look at the schematics, either integrate that hardware into something new, either modify it. And this is really, really important. And this was the first step in um, what we call democratizing uh, electronics. And this gave a boost to having things connected to the internet. So we can start with microcontrollers. Microcontrollers appeared 40 years ago, I think. Really cheap ones appeared 20 years ago. And they're really small computing devices, um, which are really easy connectable to hardware. I, maybe you recognize this picture? So this picture is what we used to do for students in college to teach them microcontrollers. So we had to buy the microcontroller, which is here, take the breadboard, solder some parts, connect it over serial. 90% of the times it used to work. The problem that we had and the problem that we faced until 10 years ago was development tools. So we had such complicated, professional, but complicated development tools, it took us more time to explain to students the development tool than to explain the microcontroller and how to actually program it. And uh, maybe you reckon, some of you recognize this problem. This changed with Arduino. I think everybody knows Arduino. Do you know what was the big invention of Arduino? The what? The fact that it has a software which looks really, really easy. So basically, it's the same microcontroller which we used to solder in college. Um, the only difference is that the whole board was open source. So if you would like to build your own Arduino, you could do that. And there's thousands of clones. Uh, and it has a really, really simple software. So Arduino made programming in electronics available. It's still not connected but we had the thing. So we could do a lamp that flashes a LED, we could do a small robot that goes around, and that was fun. After that, we had Arduino Ethernet, which is a shield you put on top of the Arduino. Sadly, it's as expensive as the Arduino, um, which added four simultaneous network connections. So basically, you could connect your device to the internet, usually to pull, up, pull down some data. Some people also build HTTP servers on it, but only with four simultaneous connections. Why? Why only four connections, or so few connections? Exactly. Indeed, indeed. So there's no processing power. That's the problem. So not having processing power requires requires some constraints. So the only thing that we could, we could do was four connections. Um, I don't want to go into the security issue. <laughs> so that, that was missing completely. You simply can't implement it. So then we had the Raspberry Pi. I think everybody knows this. This appeared um, three years ago. What was the big invention of the Raspberry Pi? The fact that it's a microcomputer didn't matter. We had those kind of board computers before. So there's 10 years already that we have those board computers. What did they invent? Linux. No, Linux was on all the boards. What? No, no, it's Linux. It's still Linux. The invention is the $35 price tag. So boards like this would be $200 at least. 
So I dr always dreamed to buy one 10 years ago, but I never had the courage to actually go and ask my parents, okay, give me $300, I want to buy a board, which I don't know how I'm going to use, but I still want to buy the board. No. But when they appeared with the board in 2012 with 35 bucks, that was amazing. Its competition dropped the price in half after they launched. So Bigabone dropped its price at around 45. So basically, this was the big invention. This is a computer. It runs Linux. It's somehow good to connect hardware, not excellent. But guess what? It has a full networking system. So you can implement anything that you have on a computer, you can implement on the Raspberry Pi. So no more full connections. Um, you have full security and a full-blown operating system. So this was somehow the step that really boosted the Internet of Things. Because we had the Arduino, we had the network connection, but it was low. We did not have some kind of cheap gateway that we could use to connect to the Internet. Since we have the Raspberry Pi today, um, we can find computers like this for $5. There's a project on Kickstarter called Chip. It's selling for $5. It's smaller and a little more powerful than this one. So keep in mind, price tag was important here. So basically, the Internet of Things is going to be composed of some, the thing in the Internet of Things will be composed out of some kind of device that com combines these two. So the hardware interface is going to build something with an Arduino-like device, because this one can talk to sensors really easy, and the networking connection is going to be built on top of some kind of a device similar to the Raspberry Pi. So this is basically the thing in the Internet of Things. And the Internet goes out here on the networking connection. Uh, is this clear up to here? So keep in mind that this, these were the important steps in the Internet of Things. So let's see uh, what kind of hardware do we have. Um, these are most of the boards that people use. Actually, these are the most common boards that people use. There's thousands of them out there. If you go to China or a Chinese store, you will see thousands and millions of clones and device similar, devices similar to these ones. These ones are the most known. So let's see the devices that are good for sensors. First of all, we have the Arduino. It's $25. It's based on the Atomega 328 chip. It's a small microcontroller. We have several flavors of Arduino. This is the most common one, the Arduino Uno. Very good for hardware, very common. I think the most used one. Then we have the chip kit. It's built by Digiland. Um, it's built on a different microcontroller called the PIC, or Programmable in Integrated Circuit. It's around $30, a little bit higher in price, a little bit more powerful. The PIC used to be the most common used microcontrollers, so you would study in school the PIC. When the Arduino appeared, uh, somehow Atomega took over. And this is because these guys were still using a very complicated professional interface to program it. This thing used a USB cable and a simple programming language, which, and the simple programming IDE. Launchpad is particularly interesting due to the price tag, which is $4. This is built by Texas Instruments. It's based on an MSP430 processor. Uh, this is really cool because it consumes way less power than these ones and it's really, really cheap. One of the things that people use this microcontroller is to simulate uh, hard hardware electronic components like registers, like um, gates, so on and so forth. It's somehow cheaper to buy a, a processor like this than to buy an actual gate chip, gates chip. So this is another really cool microcontroller. If you have any questions up to here, do you know them? Do you know, you know Arduino? Next ones. These are somehow good for sensors, but are better for processing than the Arduino. Uh, just to go back and to make it clear on what is the processing power of the Arduino, 
it has a RAM of two kilobytes. To put it in perspective, it's less than probably 10% of your Facebook picture. So that's the amount of RAM that you have. So imagine how much processing it can do. These ones are microcontrollers, which are somehow good for hardware, but not always. Better in processing. First of all, we have the STM chips, which come with an ARM Cortex M0, M3, or M4. Depends on how powerful you want it. It's similar in our, with Arduino in the form factor. It's good for hardware controlling. It has somewhere around 128 kilobytes of RAM, so it's better. And it has a chip which is around 48 megahertz. This one is interesting. It used to be called Spark, and some of you here have used it. It used to be Spark Core. Now it's called Particle. It's $35. It has an ARM chip. Partially good for controlling hardware. Um, still some functions are software implemented and don't work exactly as expected. But it has Wi-Fi integrated. So basically, if you buy that board, you can collect data from several sensors and directly send them to the cloud. Well, that's their idea. I would suggest to send them to some local processing storage and afterwards send them to the cloud. Still very interesting. I think it was the first project that would connect uh, some hardware controller with um, internet. Kickstarter back last year, I think. Esprino is particularly interesting due to the language where in which you program. All the microcontrollers are programmed in C or some language that compiles mostly C. This one has a JavaScript machine on, on it, and you can write JavaScript code. OK, so let's do the heavy lifting. These guys are good for processing, not so well suited for hardware controllers. Raspberry Pi, we discussed this. Um, it has 900 megahertz dual core chip right now, um, one gig of RAM. Uh, storage is done on an SD card. It was the pioneer in the field at this price. Um, another board which is a little bit better in hardware control is the Intel Galileo board. It's only uh, 400 megahertz, uh, but it's an x86 processor. It's a quark processor made by Intel. 256 megabytes of RAM completely headless, meaning it has no display card whatsoever, so you cannot connect the display to it. Um, it's better than the Raspberry Pi because it can read really simple sensors. The Raspberry Pi cannot interface really simple analog sensors. This one can. Um, an improvement of Intel Galileo is the Intel Edison, which we are going to use at this summer school. It's basically a phone transformed for the Internet of Things. So the platform in the Edison is the platform from Intel's Android phones. It has a Wi-Fi antenna, a Bluetooth 4 antenna, a dual-core Atom chip, and the microcontroller integrated. So somehow it's like a Raspberry Pi and an Arduino together. For the moment, there is no software to control the microcontroller. Intel is promising it will release something for the microcontroller. Um, a big exception from these two is that it has a flash storage, so you do not need an SD card for the Edison. And it's really, really small. The Beagle One Black is a board which appeared before the Raspberry Pi. It was called just Beagle Bone. It used to be, if I'm not mistaken, around $100, um, completely headless again. When the Raspberry Pi appeared, they made the BeagleBone Black, which had a display card at the moment, and they dropped the price in half. It's $45 at right now. One gigahertz ARM CPU. It has a GPU integrated, 520 megs of RAM, and a four gigabytes storage. It also uses an SD card, if you want. Udo Neo is a Kickstarter project, which is still ongoing. It was funded 5,000%, I think, already. This is a combination between a Raspberry Pi and an Arduino, almost the same chips, in the form factor of an Arduino. It uses a um, 
Freescale microprocessor uh, and an ARM4 microcontroller. Um, you should be able to see it at the end of the summer, but I think you can still back it on Kickstarter, hopefully. Parallela. This is really, really different than the others. Parallela is actually um, a Digilent Z board. That was a board for prototyping with a special chip onto it. So it has a normal processing CPU, it has an FPGA onto it, and it has a chip that is capable of processing um, 16 or 64 parallel programs at the time. So it's somehow like a um, network card, no, not network, sorry, display card, like a GPU card, but specially designed for processing. Um, and it's only $99. So the whole computer with the processing power equivalent of 45 gigahertz is only $99. Don't get me wrong, you still need to write your programs to benefit from the parallel programming, otherwise it's not going to be 45 gigahertz equivalent. But still, it's interesting that they could do it at this price, price range. So this is the parallel. Also a Kickstarter project backed two years ago, and they shipped it last year. If you have any questions up to now. We go on. So now that we talked about soft, uh, hardware, let's talk about the software. I identified four types of software for the Internet of Things. There's the prototyping software. There's the cloud software for visualization and storage. There's the professional programming software. And there's, there should be actually solution builders. Those somehow we lack. So prototyping. Prototyping is software that allows you to write really fast, pro really, to write really fast your programs, deploy them fast, and make a proof of concept. So for instance, if you want to do a startup, the first, first thing, the first thing that you need to do is to make a prototype. And tr trust me, if you use professional software, it's going to be an overhead. You don't need a, the prototype doesn't need to be a user level grade. It just needs to make a statement. Best for prototyping is the Arduino interface. Really fast, really fast code. Um, not so flexible if you want to do more um, rocket science on microcontrollers, still good for prototyping. For computers, Wildodrine is a good user, good interface. It's a cloud-based IDE. This is going, this is the IDE that we're going to use. Um, it abstracts the network connectivity of the board and allows you to program in several different softwares. So these, these are the prototyping uh, software category. Professional programming. Don't get me wrong, these are really necessary. So if you want to do a professional product, you are going to do a prototype, and then you need to think of the professional product. That needs to be user level grade, meaning it can't break, it needs to be really stable, and this is where you need software like Eclipse, which adds some overhead into programming, but is really stable. Another thing that people use is VI. So if you know VI, people use it for professional development, and it can be really good. Embed is an interesting platform. It's an online platform. So you go on embed.com. If you have a board that is supported at, for this platform, you write your code in the browser, click a button, and you can download the binary file that you need to, to upload to your board. Really professional, really good compiler, um, supported by ARM. No, I think it's run by ARM, actually. Intel XTK is the um, future professional platform. At the moment, it's still it's stable, but it still crashes sometime. Uh, in my opinion, it's going to be a real professional platform. It uses JavaScript as the language of development, and it also integrates a nice HTML editor. So you can build your Internet of Things application directly in this. Also the user interface, the HTML interface, also the programming logic. So you can check it out. Data acquisition and analysis. This is the most common software 
for the Internet of Things today. Shouldn't be, but still the most common. Xively was one of the first uh, web interfaces to collect your data and display it. So what they basically do is offer you some libraries, you integrate it into your project and send data to the cloud. They make, a ni they make nice graphs, you can monitor them, you can send the graph to your clients, so on and so forth. The very, very interesting one is Microsoft Azure. They have a machine learning and data analytics service in the cloud. So you push the data to the cloud and you can build graphs like this to detect, uh, for instance, failures. As I said, you can detect failures in tractors. This is the tool that you need. So instead of writing your own really complicated machine learning algorithms, you can use Microsoft's computing power and processing power and knowledge to build your prediction models. I would really encourage you to try this. It's really, really good. I don't work at Microsoft, <laughs> so. It's the only platform that I know of doing something like this. So it, this is how it stands out. Solution builders. Somehow these lack. So the wannabe is IBM Bluemix, but it's really, really overhead. It's a really, really big overhead. Wildadrin is one of the wannabes solution builder. It's not ready yet. Uh, it's built by the company that I founded two years ago. The idea is to allow prototyping and then allow somehow people to build solutions. So once you have a prototype, you have to have a way to build the software and deploy it to your clients. Really easy. And this is something that nobody does really well. So Wildadrin is a wannabe um, solution for this. Uh, we are going to use this across the summer school, so I will expect your feedback at the end. If you have any questions up to now. So what's next for the Internet of Things? Well, we don't know. Hopefully, we will get to the point where we can actually follow the stack that I showed you in the first slides like sensors, local processing, sending to the cloud, analytics, in integration, and storage of data. Google, Google Brillo is going to be an operating system for the Internet of Things. It's a an, an stripped-down Android, which you will be able to run on the, processing, the local processing boards. There's not much information. Google released it, no, announced it this year at Google I.O. I think it's due in the fall. So we'll see. Also, it provides some protocol, open source protocol for communication. We'll see how it goes. But it's something that we, uh, it's worth um, mentioning and following. Somehow, they, I think they want to try to replace the plain old Linux with something which is more evolved. This can be good, can be also bad. We'll see. OK, so this concludes our introduction. If you have any questions. Please do, by all means. Okay, thank you.